On today's World Inside, a first for Southeast Asian nations taking part in a weekend G7 meeting in Liverpool. What's the meaning of the G7 invitation to ASEAN members? What's on the agenda? And the power of Olympic sportsmanship and camaraderie in bringing people together. We'll hear from the president of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation how the Beijing Winter Games can make a big difference. The sport is a clean and free diplomacy. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei from Beijing. The program is live. The meeting of the G7 foreign ministers wrapped up over the weekend with several Southeast Asian nations in the meeting for the very first time. Meanwhile, it's full steam ahead for the ASEAN and other members of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, otherwise known as RCEP, which takes effect in January next year. How are ASEAN countries navigating diplomatic waters between the Western powers and neighboring nations? Before we get down to a discussion, take a look. At this information. Britain's northern city, Liverpool, welcomed the second gathering of G7 foreign ministers this year. The UK Foreign Secretary hosted the second day talks, which were joined by guest countries and representatives from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. ASEAN foreign ministers were invited to take part in a G7 session as guests for the first time in history. Most of them joined via video link. South Korea, Australia, South Africa, and India also participated as chosen G7 guests. After the G7 meeting, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveled to Indonesia, then on to Malaysia and Thailand this week on a trip designed to highlight the region's importance in Washington's push for so-called peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. The Biden administration seeks to bolster economic and security cooperation with Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, China and ASEAN have steadily stepped up engagement over the years. This year marks the 30th anniversary of ASEAN-China dialogue relations. Last month, the two sides upgraded their relationship and established the China-ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. The Economic Pact, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, will come into full force in a couple of weeks. China also begins work toward a new round of upgrades for the China-ASEAN free trade area. They are already each other's largest trading partner, with deepening economic and trade cooperation. For more on the G7 and ASEAN minister meeting, we are now joined in Washington, D.C. Peter Kuznick, professor of history from American University. In Tokyo, Lim Temwai, adjunct senior research fellow from the National University of Singapore. In Beijing, Rong Ying, vice president of CIIS, China Institute of International Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Well, one of the mark of this year's uh, G7 meeting seems to be the debate about uh, so-called human rights. And China, of course, uh, disputed about the accusations being made at the G7 meeting against the China. Professor Rong Ying, uh, from your perspective, how do you see this uh, uh, words of conflict, at least? Well, I think the uh, question of human rights uh, has always been a controversial issue, an issue, I mean, debating or dividing China on the one hand and the, uh, uh, the West uh, uh, led by the U.S. and the other. I think the very fact that China has uh, differences or different views uh, with the West, with the United States on the question of human rights does not necessarily mean at, 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 matter of, at all that China does not respect human rights. Rather, I think China has a different conceptual, philosophical outlook of how to achieve, uh, what, do, mm-hmm. what human rights mean and how to achieve human rights. Okay. And I think that is the, the fundamental differences of, the, of this issue and the fundamental things of the debate between China and the, the West, uh, mm. West. Professor Guznik, uh, China and Russia 
were the targets of the foreign ministers at the G7 meeting. Very interesting, but not out of expectation. Uh, Mr. Kuznick, uh, tell me more about, uh, you know, how should we look at the nature of G7 now? The initial focus of the G7 was going to be on China. Uh, and however, <clears throat> the crisis in Ukraine erupted and the focus instead was mostly on Russia. And so the original plan was, rail was derailed by the recent developments. Uh, the G7 is the so-called Western capitalist democracies. and they represent an important economic block in the world, almost half of the world's economy. But clearly, as a proportion of the overall world economy, they are declining while uh, China is rising. And China's economic relations with these other countries is dwarfing now the United States or the, and the G7's relation with these countries. It's a very interesting development and trend, as you just pointed out, Professor Kuznick. Now go to you, uh, Mr. Lin Tenwai uh, from Singapore. Now, I know the ASEAN members would like to walk a very fine balance between their relationship with the Western powers, so-called, and also neighboring countries, particularly neighboring power like China. Now, how do you see uh, the a trade and investment approach that we have seen both sides are trying to uh, work with the ASEAN countries. Recently at the G7 foreign ministers meeting, we also heard the phrases of the so-called uh, trade reach and investment reach. Uh, how, how would you interpret that? Well, uh, ASEAN is always very keen on maintaining ASEAN centrality uh, in regional economic uh, development. And it sees ASEAN centrality as being able to tap into uh, a lot of uh, cap uh, capacity building uh, projects. And this comes from uh, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but they're also curious about the details for the B3W uh, uh, plans and also uh, other uh, kind of uh, G7 uh, initiatives uh, that may be in place. And I think the European Union recently has also announced uh, its plans uh, for uh, capacity building, including uh, infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. Now, ASEAN welcomes all of it. And uh, because the pie is big enough to accommodate uh, all of them, as long as it maintains uh, ASEAN centrality. Right. And uh, ASEAN wants to uh, sort of contribute to uh, peace and economic development in the region by pulling all these powers together in the hub and spokes model. So a lot of these uh, great powers are, are you know, uh, spokes whereas uh, ASEAN envisions itself as a hub. So they, the spokes are all connected into the hub mm. and uh, through uh, inter, interdependency and also uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, more interactions, it is hoped I that uh, economic development can trump uh, any uh, kind of conflicts. Mr. Rong, you can see the ASEAN partners are uh, interpreting and articulating their role as a hub. Now, uh, China see it uh, uh, in a a very different way because uh, the RCEP, uh, the Regional Economic uh, uh, Partnership, is going to be very much in effect starting from January the 1st uh, coming year 2022, even though it is not uh, a extremely high level trade agreement and arrangement, but it's certainly making a great mark at a time when multilateral approaches are now being bogged down by the realities. So, Mr. Rong, how do you see RCEP, uh, a partnership between China, South Korea, Japan, and ASEAN countries, and also the real trade reach China has already established together with its regional partners? Well, ASEAN certainly is a telling example of China's sort of pursuit uh, uh, of a kind of economic partnership, economic engagement with, with ASEAN, and together with, uh, I, th I think, uh, 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 Japan, South Korea, and uh, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. And unfortunately, I think India was not, uh, has not been on board. So the, the, uh, the uh, final implementation of ASEAN, I mean, uh, July, uh, January for the first of next year is a great progress, mm -hmm. remarkable, correct landmark for China's effort and for the region as a whole. 
to achieve that. This makes a sharp contrast with the United States and others who, which are unfortunately were not able to do that for, for, for reasons, political reasons, for domestic politics. And now, of course, we are very much waiting and anticipating with great interest the so-called new economic framework the mm -hmm. Biden administration announced. And we'll see how they are going to fulfill that promise, how they are going to follow the practice of what I think the uh, regional countries, China included, has been doing and mm -hmm. has been advocating. I see. Uh, Mr. Lim, how, you know, when it comes to trade and investment, the little, as little politics as possible is needed. Um, so how would you and others within ASEAN be able to make sure that politics, geopolitics, will not filter itself into much of the trade arrangements neighbors are working so hard reach, that has, has been reached already? The reason why uh, ASEAN has been placed uh, into a centrality position is because some members of ASEAN are allies uh, of the US. Other members of ASEAN are partners and strategic partners of China. And there are also others uh, who are traditional uh, friends of uh, European Union, uh, Japan, Russia, mm -hmm. uh, and other powers in the region. Because of that, uh, ASEAN is able to aggregate the different geopolitical interests of all these great powers in the region and tries to come up with a, a common denominator for them to work together. So uh, the common denominator can also be found in infrastructure building, the creation of network of uh, smart cities, uh, and also uh, other schemes in which uh, they invite uh, other uh, great powers to sign free trade agreements, and participate in ASEAN economic community, mm. uh, which uh, t took off uh, quietly in December 2015. As you have also mentioned, ASEAN is uh, very much uh, active in the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, in which uh, China plays a very important role. Uh, at the same time, some of the ASEAN members are also in CPTPP, of which uh, the UK and China have both applied uh, to join and have uh, indicated their interest to join. So uh, the, the hope is that all these great powers can be accommodated yeah. uh, in uh, the capacity building and economic uh, development so that uh, they can uh, live in peace with each other. Mm. Professor Kuznick, your thoughts about this, particularly the strategic partnership that the Biden administration has claimed so far? Well, you have to remember, this comes on the heels of Biden's meeting with Putin, his video conference, comes on the heels of Biden's democracy summit that he just held. Uh, you know, the United States' view of this is that the United States' influence in this region has been declining as China's has been rising. For example, back in 2000, U.S. trade with the ASEAN countries was $135 billion. China's was only $40 billion. Uh, now, China, last year, China, U.S. trade was $362 billion, uh, and the US, uh, U.S. trade was $362 billion. China's was $685 billion. So the U.S. influence has been declining. The Belt and Road Initiative is involving many of these countries in important economic development. So the U.S. is looking for a way to use the G7 to reassert itself in the region. Uh, and. But the countries, most of these countries do not want to be pulled, have to choose between the West and China. So they want an independent, peaceful road. And if you look at the most late, latest development with, in terms of AUKUS, this military, uh, military agreement between mm -hmm. the United States, uh, Britain, and Australia, several of the countries in, the, uh, in ASEAN are very strongly opposed to that. We look at Indonesia's response, Malaysia's response. They don't want to see this region be further militarized, and they don't want to see this polarization and being forced to choose. They want peaceful development with both sides. Mm. And, and economic competition along these lines is fine, as long as there's peaceful economic competition right. instead of military confrontation. Now we are in a very special period of time where we talk about this. It's not just 
geopolitics, but also the pandemic. And uh, now, Mr. Lim, to what extent do you see many of the visions and also pragmatic arrangements on trade, investment, economic relationship, partnership that ASEAN countries and economies have been working on will be able to translate and implement it in real terms during this period of time. I think that is the most crucial one, not the big words, but the real thing taking place on the ground. Well, certainly, ASEAN I think is actually the most Let's have Mr. Lim first. Mr. Lim first, and then I go to Mr. Rong. Thank you. Okay, uh, ASEAN is actually looking forward to uh, a post-pandemic, or some may call endemic recovery, economic recovery. And of course, as you have mentioned, uh, the uh, most important issue is the uh, pandemic, especially with the emergence of uh, Omicron. Uh, so uh, ASEAN wants to uh, in, uh, put in place vaccine multilateralism and also uh, avoid beggar thigh neighbor policy. And so uh, in this uh, vaccine multilateralism, ASEAN hopes to work with all great powers, especially uh, vaccine producers, uh, like China, uh, the US, uh, and also uh, India, uh, to be able to, uh, because this is a common mm -hmm. uh, goal of uh, humankind, to be able to work together and implement vaccine multilateralism so that uh, the region can avoid vaccine nationalism. And so far, it has been very successful. Concretely, it has been very successful because throughout the pandemic, uh, none of the uh, countries uh, showed vaccine nationalism. And in fact, ASEAN welcomes all vaccine producers right. into the region. Okay. And so that's one way in which uh, they can prime themselves for a post-pandemic uh, situation, in addition to more economic cooperation. We only have 30 seconds left. Uh, uh, sorry for that, uh, Mr. Rong. Your thoughts also on this? Yeah, I fully agree with that. I think for ASEAN and for region as a whole, vaccine multilateralism certainly works much better than uh, vaccine nationalism. For as far as China is concerned, I think China is advocating an integrated approach by uh, developing, helping the ASEAN to develop their vaccine capabilities and in the meantime and working together for economic, sustainable economic, green economic recovery that would in the end help the region to achieve the develop, goal of development. Rongyin, Ling Tianwai and Peter Kuznick, what a pleasure. Thank you so much to the three of you gentlemen for joining us. Really appreciate it. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tianwei. Coming up in the program, the power of Olympics sportsmanship and camaraderie in bringing people together. We will hear from the president of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation. How the Beijing Winter Games can make a big difference next. This is World Insight with me, Tianwei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing. China has rejected some countries' diplomatic actions against the Beijing Winter Olympics. It started with the U.S. announcement ruling out sending officials to the Beijing Games, although U.S. athletes will participate and compete. Calling the decision, quote, a political manipulation, the Chinese foreign ministry said the resolute countermeasures will be taken. The International Olympics Committee convened its 10th Olympics summit and stood firm against any politicization of the Olympics and emphasized the need for political neutrality of the International Olympic Committee. It also called on members to engage in sports to promote peace and dialogue. On December the 10th, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres had accepted an invitation to attend the opening ceremony of the Beijing Winter Games, a nod to the universal appeal of the Olympics to bring all people together despite the pandemic and geopolitical tensions. With the Games less than two months away, let's hear from an insider's voice, Ivo Ferriani. He is the president of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation, otherwise known as IBS. Let's listen to his thoughts. It's not just a pandemic. It's also politics. 
And you heard about the recent nuance about uh, the U.S. Uh, suggesting making political gestures and some others also follow. Uh, but IOC put out a very strong and a very balanced statement. What about you know, your sport and how do you communicate all these messages with all those athletes of your sport? You know, I say always my athletes, keep the politics out of the sport. You are here to perform the sport and the sport is, um, let me say, uh, clean and free diplomacy. We try to put the people together without some uh, impact of the big politics. I don't like when the big politics try to use the athletes. The athletes, they live all the life, the best years of the life yes. for one week or two weeks, let me say, of the Olympics. And then for most, most of them is the only chance to go to Olympics in, in entire life. And then they spend the best years of the life to go there. And then if some politician wanna have, uh, some, have some issues, they have to work on the political level, not in the sport level, please. I am in these things uh, absolutely a defender of the athletes, right? And, uh, and then sport. And the Olympic truth is something important to remind to the people. Keep the truth for almost one month because we have uh, uh, one week before uh, the Olympic Games and one week after the Paralympic Games. In this period, keep down all the fights try to think a different world and the sport can create a different world. Because if you go to the village, all the athletes, all the athletes, without distinction, they sit together, they talk together, they live together. And then so that is a, let me say, um, a perfect world that works just for two weeks. But mm -hmm. let this perfect world uh, be in place. As we know, um... This is uh, the very first time for Beijing to host uh, the Winter Games. And for China, many Chinese uh, have access to the Winter Games, uh, Winter Sports, mainly in northeastern part of China. But the majority of the Chinese territory did not have access to it. And yet, with Beijing hosting the first the Winter Olympic Games, you see that enthusiasm, you know, among this 1.4 billion. Uh, and, and people were talking about there's likely to be 300 million or 400 million that will be into the sport eventually. So what would that mean to your sport? And also, what would that mean when a country that did not have, you know, 100% access to winter sport could be, you know, in love with winter sport? What does that mean globally? Winter sport, there are different kinds. So if you do a uh, cross country, uh, if you do my sport in general, okay, you have to be related to a relative cold uh, location. But also cross country, you can do that with the ski roll. So you can do in south in summer for training. So, but you have also the chance to use for hockey or ice hockey mm. to use uh, some location in south because we need uh, some uh, sport facilities indoor. So you can do now. You have to uh, the idea to produce some, let me say, figure skating, fantastic athletes from the south of China, from almost tropical uh, lands, because you have the chance to have there these, uh, these facilities, and then you can train there. So winter sport is possible to having globally if you use some indoor to develop all the rest. Mm. So I think it's a new way to approach winter sport. And then also for most of the Chinese people, the winter is not the bad weather. It's just the cold weather. So mm -hmm. you can live outside, like for the European, for everyone, you can live outside and enjoy outside your uh, free time in a different way. Being the president of a federation that is one of the most popular winter sports uh, for the Winter Olympics, how are you and your colleagues preparing for that moment? But we, me and my, my colleagues, we are preparing uh, these games since seven years when uh, uh, Beijing won the bid and then we start to co cooperate, coordinate our work with the organizing committee, Bokok. And I want to say the work with Bokok was one of the best cooperation ever with the organizing committee. Believe me, it's something, you know, I experienced. I organized, I organized the games in Torino 2006 also. So mm. as an organizer. So 
the experience with Boko was something unique, fantastic, really a great uh, cooperation. And then, uh, okay, we have to face some problems, but always with open mind. That was a great, great, great uh, moment. So we, why, we why approached would we say the so? I mean, maybe, maybe people would say, oh, you were just being polite in saying so. Were well, there no, some no, no. stories you can share with us, how it works? Uh, me, everybody called me sharp. Because me, I said the things are very sharp. So I don't have a too many filter in, in this regard. So, and, uh, but, you know, again, we had a lot of discussion uh, regarding, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, location of the venues or uh, the things. But, you know, the thing is, uh, and I was surprised because when we write some questions, okay, so, okay let's talk. No, normally said, oh, no, 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 no somebody because they have decided uh, i don't know in a different way so okay let's talk and frankly speaking today with the uh, with the board of the organizing committee i said we are friends normally we fight in the last second you know <laughs> because <laughs> it's something to to pull in this the regards and so on but <clears throat> in particular with uh john dong mr, mr. john dong and shuan in particular wow, we are very good friends Anyway, discussion, always, because we have a submission, but they always, uh, frankly speaking, very open mind. So, I, I don't want to give flower to anyone, you know, I'm not the person. What I have to say, uh, I'm surprised, we are the last mile of the marathon, mm. and uh, I, the only thing I have to say, don't lose the focus, because everything is good at the moment. Well said. My exclusive with Ivo Ferriani, the president of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation, talking about the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympic Games. That's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.